And welcome back to another edition of Dark Matters Radio. I'm your host. My name is Don Ecker. If I had to pick one radio show in all the years that I have either hosted radio or I've appeared as a guest, the show you are about to hear would figure absolutely as the most prominent one ever in my mind. As a matter of fact, this show in some quarters is legendary. It took place in January of 1995, January the 21st, and my guest that evening was noted UFO skeptic Philip Klass. Now, back in those days, Class was considered absolutely the premier UFO skeptic, or as even Class himself used to joke, I was always the skunk that entered the UFO garden party. Now, I had known Class almost since my initial entry into the field of UFO research first met him on the telephone back in the late 1980s while I was director of research for UFO magazine. And I got to say that if we were not talking UFOs, I found class to be quite likable. And at that time, I often found it rather strange or unusual the way some in the UFO field absolutely loathed Class. Later, I was to find out that Class had an extremely sneaky side to him. As a matter of fact, going back into some of the UFO history that I dwelled into, I found Class would often go on letter writing campaigns in an effort to discredit someone that he disagreed with. Now, in retrospect, what happened on this show really offended me in a very profound way. Like I said, this happened in 1995. Now, in 1990, at the MUFON UFO Symposium that took place in Pensacola, Florida, I literally saved Phil Class's butt. It was at the Friday night get-together. Of course, this was usually a meeting in a bar where the MUFON Symposium was being held. Everybody could gather, have drinks, chit-chat, talk, see old acquaintances, and what have you. And it was at that Friday night get-together, I was sitting with class at a table down in Pensacola when a huge guy, about 250 pounds, came up to the table, obviously drunk, recognized Phil Class, and literally started picking on class and got right in his face. Now... This offended me for a lot of reasons, not the least of which Phil was, at that time, getting up there in years. He was physically a small man, and it was apparent to me that he was quite, well, I don't know if terrified is the right word, but he was very upset. I jumped up from the table, pushed that guy back, and I shamed him into leaving. And I was prepared to go further if I had to. I've never been one to let a little guy get picked on by a big guy and do nothing about it. Well, that made no difference. Class was one of those people that had, like I said, that sneaky side to him. Probably during the course of this show, I should have reminded him of that incident. But at any rate, you're going to have to make up your own mind when you hear it. Now, this particular radio program becomes very obvious to the listener that class was contentious almost from the beginning. As you'll hear within the first half hour of the broadcast, Phil Class was ready to hang up the telephone, especially when I would start to point out some faulty holes in Phil's logic. 
And this was literally the last time I ever spoke to Phil Class prior to his death. So, without a lot of further ado, let's get on with the show. I think you're going to find this vastly interesting. And uh, you're going to have to make up your own mind about what happened here. But, on with the program. This is UFOs Tonight that took place January the 21st, 1995. Hope you enjoy it. Already three weeks into 1995, January the 21st, 1995. My name is Don Ecker, the show, UFOs Tonight. And each week, coast to coast, we bring you news on one of humankind's most misunderstood subjects, and that, of course, is the subject of UFOs. And joining me tonight in studio once again, Mr. Dwight Schultz, to help me carry this program through. Dwight, good to see you. Good to see you, Don. I've been looking for CRN. Uh, I can't find it. I know it announces it itself. It presents it presents this show every week, uh, but I have yet to see CRN. So I, I'm not the quite sign, sure. The shine is right over there in the window. Well, but I mean, this show is supposed to deal with truth, and I, I don't know the CRN presents this show. But I do. Can I say something, Don? I want to say happy birthday to Frank Lupo tonight. Uh, it's his 40th birthday. He was a writer, producer, and co-creator of the A-Team and a very good friend of mine for a very long time. And there's another new listener in the Bay Area. 40. 40. Big can, can, you, can you trust anybody over uh, 30? I can trust anybody right about now as old as I am. Oh. So, uh, and we have another new listener tonight in the Bay Area, a very, very dear friend of mine, John Comerford, uh, a man who was my agent in New York City and... Um, uh, I is responsible for me making uh, some uh, some very very good decisions uh, at, at a time when I I didn't trust what I was hearing and he told me and steered me in the, in the right way and I'm I'm, a, I'm 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 well off I guess today because of John and uh, he's a bright this man. This is all touching, but what the hell does that have to do with UFOs? Well, I, you, you, you told me I could say oh, anything oh. I wanted to say. <laughs> it didn't matter. I mean, isn't that what we do every week? Go ahead, make me look bad. All now. right. <laughs> and we have a great show tonight. And I want you to go ahead and tell everybody. This is a very special show for me because this is someone that I have uh, watched and read his books. And I've listened to him, and watched him debate, and uh, he is. Uh, he claims to be a voice of sanity and reason, and I think he. I think he is to a large degree, uh, but not all the time. And I've really been looking forward to this show tonight. Well, you know, this show presents all questions of the UFO question of the UFO enigma. Uh, we present all sides, just like UFO magazine does. We take a look at the pro as well as the con side. And tonight's guest is a special guest. It's a gentleman that was on this program uh, before roughly a little over a year and a half ago, give or take a couple of months. Yes. And it's somebody that I've been trying to get back. And last summer, uh, for a number of months, I tried to get this gentleman on the, uh, on the program because at that time, the question about the Roswell incident was heating up. Uh, there was Roswell? information. Well, this is, this is a place where uh, there used to be an atomic bomb wing hmm. about almost 50 years ago down there, a bomb wing called the 509th. And in July of 1947, if we are to believe people like uh, William Moore, uh, Stanton Friedman, Kevin Randall, Don Schmidt, Some a, of those very strange, English, a very strange incident happened. Hmm. People claim that uh, a so-called flying saucer crashed there, and subsequently the government covered it up. Well, tonight's guest has been described as the Sherlock Holmes of ufology. 
Uh, I think Walt Andrus, the international director of MUFON, referred to him as the younger brother of Sherlock Holmes, but we're not sure about that. But tonight's guest is none other than Mr. Phil Class. Phil has been a voice, although on the on the pro side of the UFO question, not always a welcome voice, but has been a voice in the field of UFO research for over 30 years. And I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome Phil once again to UFOs tonight. Phil, thank you for joining us back in Washington. Well, Don, thank you very much. I expect that those will be the kindest words <laughs> that I will hear during the next two hours. Well, this is Dwight Schultz, uh, Mr. Class, and it's a great pleasure and an honor Hi, to uh, share our radio program with you. Phil, let's uh, let's get right down to brass tacks. This week, uh, I received your latest issue of the Skeptics UFO newsletter, and I would like to take this opportunity uh, to uh, advise everybody that has an interest in this field that I think it's very important that publications like this uh, should be read. And before we get the the program over tonight, Phil, I want you to tell everybody how they can how they can subscribe to the Skeptics UFO Newsletter. But once again, you have taken uh, a very uh, investigative tack toward the question of some of what you call key eyewitness testimony. Um, the, the very first person mentioned in the new issue of the Skeptics UFO Newsletter is Jim Ragsdale, who is a witness that Kevin Randall and Don Schmidt used in their, uh, their latest book, The Truth About the UFO Crash at Roswell. And even uh, even Mr. Randall now is stating that Mr. Ragsdale has changed his story from what it originally was. Significantly. What, what can you What can you tell us about about this? And and for those people out there, uh, Phil, that that may not be aware of this this individual in the field, can you lay a little background for that? Well, I've never met him. I when I was down to Roswell last March for the press conference, um, in behalf of. Randall and Schmidt's new book. Um, I tried to meet with him. I talked to him on the phone, invited him to dinner. Uh, he claimed that he had, or said he had an illness that would prevent it. So I've never met the gentleman. Um, and no, I think to be fair, Phil, we have to say that, that Mr. Ragsdale is in fact very ill. Well, <laughs> he told me he had, uh, as I recall it. Uh, uh, cancer of the throat or something of that sort, a, a rather serious. But in any event, um, as you and I know, uh, one of the ways in which one spots a tall tale is if the person significantly changes their story. What do I mean by significant? Well, if you, for example, were to say that uh, you had a UFO sighting shortly after lunch, about 1 o'clock in the afternoon, and then sometime later in describing it, you said that it happened about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, I do not consider that a significant discrepancy. Was, you know, particularly if it happened a few years ago. But if, for example, you said you were alone, walking alone at night, when you saw the UFO, and then later, in a later account, you said you were walking with your brother and sister and wife, that there were four of you present. That would be what I would consider a significant discrepancy. <clears throat> well, the, the uh, fact that Ragsdale, in fact, did change his story, and there is some speculation about this, uh, that it may have been for a monetary purpose. That was what Kevin Randall said right. in his talk. Uh, and if Ragsdale had been the only witness to this <laughs> event, that certainly would cast doubt on it. But let, let's go back to the very beginning, and, and we, can, we can hit on Ragsdale again. Yeah. Uh, in, in July of 1947, the only nuclear-powered, uh, nuclear-armed military unit in the planet was the 509th bomb wing, the same folks that dropped the atomic bomb on the Japanese, which ended World War II. They were based at uh, Walker Field outside of Roswell, New Mexico. It was called Roswell Army Airfield at the time, but later renamed Walker Air, uh, Airfield. And the uh, group itself was considered one of the most elite 
and secret secret groups then in existence because of the fact that they were the only people that had nuclear weapons. Uh, along sometime between July 2nd to July 4th, an event happened that today still is, uh, is much argued over, which is one of the reasons this program is on the air tonight. Uh, originally, the regular Army Air Force, it was before the, uh, it became the United States Air Force, it was still then a part of the Army. Right, it was a couple of months. Actually, the transition, I think, occurred in mid or late September uh, when it changed from being the Army Air Force to the U.S. Air Force, an independent service. Right, an independent service. But it was uh, the regular Army Air Force that initially made the press release that the RAAF, in fact, had gotten their hands on a flying disc, not debris, not, uh, you know, not, not parts of a weather balloon or anything else. They specifically stated a disc. Did you want to say something, well, Roy? Yeah, the Air Force, in fact, said they had, re or the RAAF, had recovered a flying saucer. Now, and I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Class, yeah, if you would right, apply, uh, may I just say, well, yeah, I think they called it a flying disc. The, uh, I'm the, not sure. The headline it. said saucer disc was used in the story. Okay. And I wanted to ask you, would you apply your rationale that a tall tale can be spotted when a story changes significantly? Uh, to that story that the Air Force released that they had recovered a flying saucer and then the next day said it was a weather balloon. Could you apply your rationale to that story? That is a, a good question that you asked, right? Um, <clears throat> let's suppose that you're out walking tomorrow and you find some mysterious debris, for example, and you report uh, to your local newspaper that you have found some uh, mysterious debris. And supposing the next day that um, um, the Army announces, after examining it, that this is the debris from a test missile that went astray. Um, <clears throat> now, the fact is that we talk about the uh, Roswell Army Air Force or the Army Airfield announcing. Now, you and I both know that an airfield does not announce anything, that human beings announce things. And in fact, if one goes back... Well, to just, a, just for one second, it did say R-A-A-F announces. Recovered a flying saucer. Right. right. And fortunately, now... Uh, young Lieutenant Hout, Walter Hout, then a young lieutenant, had no training, no formal training or background as a press officer. He'd been trained as a navigator and a bombardier. And as he explained to me, you know, he uh, was sort of drafted and told that you are now public information office. And when he wrote the release, he did not attribute it to anyone. He said the uh, Roswell Army Airfield announces or has come into possession. I don't have it right in front of me here. And the reporter at the Roswell Daily Record, being a good reporter, uh, said to him, uh, you know, to whom shall we attribute this? Um, shall I attribute it to you, young Lieutenant Walter Hout? And Hout told him, no, attribute it to Major Jesse Marcel, the intelligence officer. But Phil, wait a minute. We both know that Hout would not have taken that responsibility to write a press release about that unless he had been directed, which he also stated he was directed by Colonel Blanchard, who was the base commander. This is what he now states. But if you go back to the original um, release as reported in the Roswell Daily Record, and, and I can dig it out later, the point, the you point. will see that he attributed. He yeah, said, I have, I have the, I have the, the uh, press now, report would, in the book. But you no, wait think, a minute. No, wait you a think minute. a young lieutenant would insult his commanding officer? I was no. in, I was in the, I was in the United States Army. Now I know that you had never served in uniform. Dwight has never served in uniform. But I can tell you 
from my own firsthand experience that had that young lieutenant had made a gaffe as huge as that, he would have been out counting socks in some supply room in the Antarctic because if, in fact, it was not, as has been stated, that they, in fact, did get a flying disc and he had not been authorized by his colonel, he would have been hung out to dry. Well, as, a matter, of fact, know that as a matter of fact, now let me comment on these things, Don. As a matter of fact, a couple weeks later, Hout was transferred to another job, he told me, uh, because of this gaffe, and Marcel, a few months later, was transferred to a desk job in Washington, D.C. And Marcel was and, also promoted to a lieutenant colonel. And Marcel, two years later, in the middle of the Korean War, he resigned from the Air Force. And if you look was at he his... Promoted, at, Phil? And you look at his was document. Major Marcel promoted to a lieutenant colonel? Um, I would have to check the record. Well, the answer the answer is yes, and the answer you know, is also, no, wait a minute, the answer is also that Marcel was the gentleman that wrote for President Harry Truman the press release that the Russians, in fact, had developed an atomic device. That is his claim, and it's another false claim. He says... Now, wait a minute. I uh, just had Jesse Marcel Jr. on this program two weeks ago, and I asked him that specifically, and he said, yes, his father, in fact, did write that release, which President Truman read, uh, to announce to... All right, would you, would you like States. to make a small $10 bet here, Don? As a matter of fact, if you'll check, okay, you'll, I'll find, tell you you'll, find, you'll find that President Truman did not make an announcement, did not read it on the radio, as Marcel wrongly recollected. Well, let me take but a break. Actually, the for White a House put out a press release. Let me, let me take a break for a commercial because we're two minutes past it, and when we come back, we'll continue this, okay? All right, fine. Okay, we are going to uh, continue with my guest tonight, joining us by telephone, telephone from Washington, D.C., Mr. Phil Klass a senior editor with Aviation Week and Space Technology, and one of the best-known skeptical uh, researchers of the UFO field around anywhere. And we are back with my guest, Phil Class. All right, Phil, you were saying. I, I just checked Marcel's records. You're correct. He was promoted to a lieutenant colonel on November 22nd, which would have been several months after this incident. And so, so we should get back to tall tales can be spotted when they change, when the story changes significantly. Yes. Well, the question that we discuss, were discussing was who really authorized the issuance of this release? Now, if Blanchard authorized it, Certainly, when Hout was asked who authorized this, on whose say-so, he should have said Colonel Blanchard. But instead, and I'm reading from the original Roswell Daily Record, it says the Intelligence Office, this is the first sentence, the Intelligence Office of the 509th Bombardment Group at Roswell Army Airfield announced at noon today that the field has come into possession of a flying saucer. According to information released by the department over the authority of Major J.A. Marcel, intelligence officer, the disc was recovered on a ranch in Roswell, and so on. So it was Hout now claims that he was told to put out the release on the authority of Blanchard. If so, uh, he, um, he made a major goof. So what we have to do is to depend on this original article that it was Major Marcel. Now, I have heard... Well, there's always another side to the coin that perhaps the reporter... Now, I'm just going going using your logic. Perhaps the reporter uh, made a gaffe. Perhaps the reporter made a mistake. Oh, come on. Yeah, per perhaps. Perhaps. But... Let's let's examine the well, why, why would Hout say today that Blanchard was the person that authorized it? I'm I'm curious. What what your reasoning is? I missed your your question, Don. I'm curious as to why you would discount today what what uh, Walter Hout has stated about Colonel Blanchard being the individual that authorized him to make the press release. 
Oh, that, that's his story today. Why? Yeah. Why would he? Why would he change it if, in fact, it was Major Marcel that authorized him? Because well, Blanchard, Blanchard was was the base commander. Would have been in Hout's chain of command. Marcel, who was the intelligence officer yeah. and not part of the press uh, chain of command, uh, wouldn't would not have been generally the person that would have authorized how to make that press release. So we're trying to determine, forty-seven years later, almost who, forty-eight. Who told Hout to put out the press release? Right. And according to the article, the first one published in the Roswell Daily Record, it was the intelligence officer, office, not the base commander, not Blanchard, but Marcel. Now, I've heard it said, I've not been able to confirm this, as we both know, it was about, oh, roughly three weeks earlier that the first flying saucer, flying disc report made national headlines by Kenneth Arnold on June 24th. If we discount and, all the Foo Fighter reports from, yeah, from the end of and, the Second World War. Yeah, and Ezekiel's flying uh, flying wheel. And the ghost no, rockets. Let's the ghost rockets. Into Ezekiel. Yeah. All right. So the, the first report of, that achieved national, international prominence was the one of... of uh, June 24th, that was just several weeks earlier, and as a result, there were dozens of, <clears throat> maybe even hundreds, of UFO sighting reports that were making... Now, as a result of what? Pardon? You just said, as a result, there were hundreds of reports. Now, I'm asking, as a result of what? Of... Are you suggest? No, I'm just saying, are you, were there hundreds of reports, or were the hundreds of reports the result of Kenneth Arnold's sighting? I want to know, right, being very clear as to what you're saying. Um, they were, in my opinion, the result of the national um, hysteria, uh, attention, and widespread publicity. I just wanted yes. to be very clear that that's what you were saying. Yes, yes. And so I... Because heard, another rational person could take another position. Yes. Yeah, yes. I've heard it said, I've <laughs> not been able to confirm it, that a prize, because of, you know, what are these? What are these flying discs? Uh, that a prize of $3,000 had been offered to anyone that recovered it, one of these flying discs. I've not been able to uh, confirm that, but I've seen references to it. It is conceivable, conceivable, that Major Marcel uh, had heard of that and that he hoped to be the one that collected the $3,000. Mr. Class, that is worthy of you. No, wait a minute, <laughs> Phil. Phil. Now the man was an, the man was the intelligence officer of the yep. 509th. Um, and and as we both know, his military intelligence officers are never wrong. Oh well, absolutely, absolutely not. Nor is Phil Class. Pardon? Nor is Phil Class. <laughs> <laughs> Phil, that that's not worthy. That's not a worthy remark. I I don't for one second even would even conceive of that. This man was a combat veteran of, of the Second World War. Not a combat veteran, a combat veteran. Boy, Phil, you're, you're playing with fire because you know, I've got the kill button here. <laughs> I've got the kill button. Uh, this man was a combat veteran of the Second World War. Did you tell me to be nice to this man tonight? I did. <laughs> I did. I mean, Phil. You know, Phil's back there. He's he's up late. He's he's uh, he's moving along now, and and we. <laughs> Phil, the man would not have risked his military career, nor can I believe that he would have mistook this debris as something other than prosaic. If in fact it was not prosaic, he had explain? never. He had never seen. So far as I've been able to determine, he had never seen a radar corner reflector, a radar target. But he sure had seen weather balloons, and these balloons were no different than any other balloons. Oh, they were. They were very much different. And you see... How? Just, how were they different? How were they different? Normally, a, a weather balloon... Let's go back. Can I just say one thing that you're, yeah. you're butting the New York Times here because the New York Times says that they weren't different. In fact, the New York Times says that the photograph that appeared the next day on, on the on the Roswell paper was the mogul balloon. So just so you know that. Oh, oh, oh 
right. Well, we're going to have to come back and talk about what do we mean by a mogul balloon. No, no, no. It's just the balloon. That they're they're saying that what was on, what was that that was what crashed. That was the crash material. So when you say that he that 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 Marcel didn't know what this looked like, that we all know what it looked like. That was not nothing extraordinary. It was all right, like, uh, well, gentlemen. I'll give you a choice. You either give me two minutes of uninterrupted speaking time or I'm going to bed. Now you have your choice. Sure, you can have it in about four minutes, Phil, because in, in about a minute we've got to go to the half hour break. Well, as I say, you either give me as a guest the opportunity to respond without interruption or else I'm going to bed. It's past midnight and I'll give you your choice. Well, I just said sure as soon as we come back from the break. All right. My Phil, you're getting testy. Uh, no, it's just that you're paying me $50,000 for this appearance. Well, it's, but from I don't, the, it's from the CIA. But I don't need the money. It's from the no, CIA, no, sir, to They've be, got all kinds of money. To be, to be very serious, when you make statements, it is traditional to allow the guest then to respond. And what I was going to tell you was that radar was developed during World War II highly secret at that time, and the average GI did not see uh, a, a radar target balloon. Okay, now, Phil, we're going to have to take a break. When we come back, right. we'll continue with this. My name is Don Ecker. The show is UFOs Tonight. You've been listening to myself, Dwight Schultz, and our special guest joining us from Washington, D.C., Mr. Philip Class. And by the sounds of it, I'd say Phil's upset. But when we come back, he's going to have his two minutes to finish on this idea of radar. And you're not going to want to miss this. We'll be taking calls shortly. I said we'll be taking calls shortly now that I'm on mic. <laughs> and if you're with me, 818-213-310, area codes. It's phenomenal. Once again, we'll be taking calls shortly, so get out your pen and paper and take down these numbers. If you're within the 818-213 or 310 area codes. Phil, I tell you, we're going to go back now with our guest, Phil. And Phil, you were talking about radar. Yes. Um, the weather balloons that were being launched from uh, Roswell Army Airfield did not use radar targets. They were balloons that carried little um, uh, instruments that measured the barometric pressure and would radio back, but they were not tracked by radar because in those early post-war years, there were not many radars available for tracking uh, balloon-borne targets. They would come along through the years. So Marcel probably, almost certainly, had never seen a radar corner reflector, and especially the unusual type that was being used for the Project Mogul balloon experiments. So. It is not at all surprising that he would find the debris uh, unusual. Now, let's, let's read the description given the next day by rancher Mac Brazel, a man who found it, and let's listen to his description. Uh, he says uh, the article which appeared in the uh, July 9th issue of the Roswell Daily Record he said, uh, Brazel said that he did not see it, the object, fall from the sky, and did not see it before it was torn up, so he did not know the size or shape it might have been. But he thought it might have been about as large as a tabletop. The balloon which held it up, now the it is the corner radar reflector or the radar target. The balloon which held it up, if that was how it worked, must have been about 12 feet long, he felt, measuring the distance by the use of the room in which he sat. The rubber was a smoky gray in color and scattered over an area about 200 yards in diameter. When the debris was gathered up, the tin foil, paper, tape, and sticks made a bundle about three feet long and seven or eight inches thick. 
while the rubber made a bundle about 18 or 20 inches long and about 8 inches thick. In all, he estimated, the entire lot would have weighed maybe 5 pounds. Okay, now. That if, if, if the in, description by the man who found the debris. Right. If, in fact, uh, this material was, to begin with, let, let's just start looking at, at what Brazel is credited to have said. Because he's been dead for about 35 years now, roughly. Right. Uh, well, yeah. Uh, he died in the 60s, as I about recall. About 1960 or 61, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If but this, this material... Is what he said, this is what he said on the night of Tuesday night, July 8th, 1947. If this material was spread out over 200 yards... Yes. What would have caused these balloons to spread out over that over that distance? Because what we're talking about... Let's, are, let's are very not just typical, talk balloon. Let's talk balloon and radar reflector. Well, what was the radar reflector but balsa wood and, and aluminum foil? There's nothing remarkable about either no, balsa wood well, or aluminum foil. Well, no, the aluminum foil would not... You need the aluminum foil to reflect the radar energy. Right. But aluminum foil has no structural strength. So what you do is you... To make a radar reflector in those days, you take thin tin foil and you glue it or attach it to some parchment paper, something that has structural strength that you need to support the uh, uh, structure of the radar target. And uh, furthermore, as uh, Professor Charles Moore has said, <clears throat> in terms of the Project Mogul Balloon, to strengthen it, they, the manufacturer added sort of like a scotch tape with colored flower, figures of flowers and so on that he happened to have in his shop. So this is the radar reflector consists of parchment to which is attached tin foil. But my point, Bill, is that stick. there's not a thing about this that's remarkable. It's not remarkable if you have seen it, but if you've never seen one before, and if you've never seen the debris from a crashed one before, Excuse it me. is unusual. Excuse me, just for a second. Uh, if, take Brazel's description, the one that you've just given me, that came from the man all right, himself. Yes. Scotch tape. Is there anything... Extra- he, he was able to recognize the scotch tape, right? Um, he said that. So he recognized that. Then he recognized the rubber. Everything that you say, he said, is recognizable, and he obviously recognized it. So there was nothing extraordinary. He clearly was able to describe ordinary things. But Brazel had never seen anything like this before. Well, he had because he knew how to say scotch tape. He knew how to say rubber. He knew how to say those things. They're not in your lexicon. If you haven't seen it before, you say, I don't know what that stuff was. He said rubber, he said scotch tape, he described it very accurately and eloquently. But it was the, um, let me, let me ask you this, Dwight, supposing, um... Can, oh, and I'm a little unclear, did, did, did Brazel, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but did Brazel's description appear before or after the Air Force retraction? Before or after what? The Air Force retraction of the story. It appeared... Um, the next day after General Ramey, General Ramey in the early evening of Tuesday, July 8th, after the debris had been flown there and been examined by a man by the name of Newton, who was his meteorologist, who said, you know, it's a weather balloon and a radar target. And uh, so Ramey announced it um, the early evening, or I guess about six in the evening on Tuesday. And as almost as Ramey was announcing it in Fort Worth, or shortly afterwards, Basil was being interviewed in the office of the Roswell Daily Record, both by their reporters and by a reporter named Kellaheen. Uh, Callahan uh, from the Associated Press office in Albuquerque who had driven down following the announcement of the uh, flying saucer being recovered. 
Well, let's jump ahead to, to approximately 1979, 1980, when Jesse Marcel was interviewed on the uh, television program In Search Of, which was narrated by Leonard Des Moines. Uh, when he was interviewed and in speaking about the Roswell incident, no, actually, I guess, Phil, it would have been later than that, because well, Moore's, actually, Moore's, book, Moore's book came out in 1980, so it probably would have been, oh, 81, 82. Well, let's Marcel's. go back to some of his earlier interviews that he gave in 1978 to uh, a New Orleans TV station. Uh, that uh, uh, discovered him uh, uh, on or about the time that Stanton Friedman discovered him. Well, he was buddies with with that television station, the program, the manager. radio station. Uh, but uh, but in any they were ham radio ahead. operator buddies. Yeah, go ahead. Well, what what I was saying though, uh, I'm uh, you, you. Let's discuss that in a second. But when he went on the television program in search of. He was very articulate that what he found, he could neither identify, and according to his testimony, they tried to burn this material, they tried to cut the material, they tried to dent the material with a sledgehammer, and he was very succinct in stating that the material could not be damaged, cut, or burned. They tried. This is what he said. Now, my, my question is, if, if in fact this material was not some type of exotic material, but was in fact this prosaic black rubber, uh, balsa wood, aluminum foil, scotch tape, how could he not have, have harmed the material, and why would he have said that? All right. And that, that, those are good questions. Don, did you ever serve as an intelligence officer? I was involved in special operations, Phil. Right, I had but, a top okay. security well, clearance. Let's, let's, let's try to imagine that you were Jesse Marcel, and let's turn back the clock, and you find this unfamiliar debris on the Brazil Ranch, and you bring it back. Now, this is 1947. Now, you know the Cold War is getting hotter, as an intelligence officer, you know that the Russians have captured a number of very uh, clever uh, German engineers, taken them back to the Soviet Union to try to exploit their, their expertise. So your first thought as an intelligence officer in July of 47 should be that, my gosh, Maybe this is a Soviet spy vehicle that crashed here. All right. Now, as an Air Force, Army Air Force intelligence officer, you know that the largest center of technical expertise within the Army Air Force is at Wright Field. They have all kinds of metallurgists. They have all kinds of electronics experts there. Now you have in your hand what could be some very advanced material that the Russians have somehow, maybe through the Germans, uh, discovered and they're using to make spy vehicles. My gosh, would you try to burn this? Would you try to hit it with a sledgehammer? Heavens no, you would protect it as if it were life itself. You'd take it back, you would call Colonel Blanchard, say, Colonel Blanchard, notify Wright Field. We found this unusual material. We're taking excellent care of it. We're going to fly it to Wright Field and let them run tests in their laboratory. But according to what Marcel said, so the it, debris field, now wait a minute, the yeah. debris field was several hundred yards wide, and he estimated that this debris field was approximately three quarters of a mile long, and there was a lot of this stuff. Now, I can understand. Now, that's what he recalled 30 years later, but we have Brazel's statement, which indicates, but again, as a matter of fact, if you will go back to the interview that Brazel gave back in 1978 or 79 to the New Orleans station, and I have a partial transcript. You mean of Marcel? That. Marcel. Marcel, right. yes. Uh, you will find that Brazel, 30 odd years later, said that he gave the stuff to the boys in the back room 
that he had more important work, paperwork, to do. So he did not actually watch them allegedly hitting it with a sledgehammer or trying to burn it. He had more pressing paperwork. Okay, Phil, let's go right, well, to right there. something about how urgent or important he thought it was at that time. I've got to take another quick break. When we come back, we'll continue this very fascinating conversation. My special guest tonight, Mr. Phil Class, Senior Editor at Aviation Week Space Technology and someone that has been chasing the UFO riddle for well over 30 years. My name is Don Ecker. The show is UFOs Tonight. You're listening to the Cable Radio Network. And stand by because we have lots more. And that, if I'm not mistaken, is a theme from The Outer Limits. Now, let me tell you about gray matter. You know, back with my very special guest this evening, Mr. Phil Class. Phil, the last time Renee gave out the telephone numbers, the board lit right up across the board. Now, we're not going to take any calls for a couple of minutes yet because I want to continue this, but uh, we're going to start taking some calls then shortly. Now, the thing that, that Marcel did state, however, when he was talking before the cameras of In Search Of, is that he did try to cut some of this material. He did try to burn some of this material with a Zippo lighter, and... Uh, this material, according to his testimony, could not be marked. What What do you think, if, if in fact it was the material that you're describing, balsa wood, aluminum foil, how could this be? Or do you believe that Marcel is telling a lie, and if so, why would he? Well, first off, if one goes back to his earlier statements given in 78 and 79, he corrected himself. At one point he said, <clears throat> I don't have the transcript in front of me, that you could not bend it. And then he corrected himself to say, you could not crease it, that it would unbend. That's exactly what you would expect if it was tin foil attached to rigid parchment. But we must not, I'm getting along in years, I'm even older than Jesse Marcel was when he was trying to recall these things, and you're a very young man, Don, but sometime when you get older, you'll discover <laughs> that when you try to recall things that happened 30 or 40 years ago, that some errors creep into it. But let's let's talk about. If, well, I can if, recall if, 30 years if, ago. I'm 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 going to be I'm going to be 45 my next birthday, and well, 30 years ago, I'm, I was 15, and I can very well recall well, a lot of things. I'm more human, thinking. and I'm 47, and I do have trouble recalling things. And but I, if <laughs> Marcel did these things, tried to burn it, tried to hit it with a sledgehammer that he later recalled, then he was a terribly stupid person. Now, as a matter of fact, Marcel should have known, because everybody in Roswell knew if they read the newspaper, that the Army Missile Center at White Sands, about 150 miles south of Roswell was testing experimental uh, rebuilt German V-2 missiles and occasionally they would go astray. Uh, one uh, impacted uh, not too far from Roswell, another one fell into Mexico and so on. But not now, during this time frame. Pardon? Not during this time oh, frame. Uh, 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 I, if you'll come or if you'll go and look at the Roswell Daily Record you'll find that several weeks before the Roswell incident, a uh, one of these V-2s went astray and impacted, oh, I think about 50 miles from Roswell. It was going on at the same time. And if Marcel read the local newspaper, as I did on microfilm, he would have known that. And so th when he found this uh, debris, if it struck him as being unusual, unique. The first thing he should have done before he told how to put out a press release, the first thing he should have done was to call White Sands and say, hey guys, I know you're firing uh, V-2 missiles. I know they sometimes go astray. Uh, I found this unusual debris. Could it be from one of these formerly secret German V-2 missiles 
the true testing. Yes, but, but still, he the, didn't do that. The material. Not, and this also tells us that he was not a very smart intelligence officer. Why did they promote him? Why did they promote him? Uh, probably because he had had a reasonably good record. Well, yeah. Why? Why did he resign two years later? claiming that living in Washington, D.C. was an undue hardship. Well, everybody knows that's true, so he was not a liar anyway, right? <laughs> but, Phil, <laughs> Phil, the one thing about this case, and you've got to admit that there are some very, very strange aspects to this case. For years, Randall and Schmidt had tried to find out from Sheridan Cabot what, in fact, Cavett witnessed there. Cavett steadfastly re maintained that he was not present during the time of this incident. He told them that time and time again. Sheridan Cavett, of course, was have the you CIC heard, have you, no, have you heard the tape I gave recordings? Two minutes. I have gave you it. heard the tape recordings? No. I haven't either. Why won't Randall and Schmidt release those? Well, Randall they is going. These, Randall is claims. Randall is going to send me a copy of these interviews. Good. Randall is going Good. to do that. But let me finish. Cavett told him time and time again that he was not present. Yet, with the Air Force report that was released on September the 8th, Cavett came out and said, "Yes, I was there. I went out with Marcel. I saw the material. I knew right away what it was." Is what Cavett said. I knew right away. Well, if in fact he did know right away, he didn't tell his friend Jesse Marcel what it was. Or he didn't tell Colonel Blanchard, because if he would have, this whole brouhaha would never have happened. How do you explain that? It's unexplainable. Well, um, again, 40 years takes its toll of your recollection. It's true. I am, I am waiting to hear those tapes. Uh, Kevin Randall made that statement, or Dick Don Schmidt, I forget which. That, you know, this is contrary. We have it on tape. I said, send me a copy of the tape I've never heard from. Well, let's stick to things that we can, uh, you know, we can look at in real time. Now, the William Broad, in his article in the New York Times front page, uh, indicates and says that that photograph was a mogul balloon. That's that photograph that appeared in the Roswell paper in the retraction was the mogul balloon. Now, you, you can tell us today, because you must know what that, you, you know very well what that looked like was the debris that was there in the office that they were holding the mogul balloon. Well, there were several or many mogul balloons. Well, was it similar to a mogul I, balloon? What they were holding, was it similar to a mogul balloon? All right, now give me one minute without interruption. The debris that was found on the Brazil Ranch is believed to be that from a test balloon that was launched on June 4th to test the radar tracking. Could the radar successfully track it? And it was not one of the giant mogul balloons that would later be used to carry the very heavy instruments. It was part of the mogul program. But it is my understanding and I confess that I've been much too busy with my condominium and my Aviation Week work to read all 700 pages of the Air Force documents, that these were more conventional. It was a cluster of more conventional weather balloons, a cluster carrying this unusual uh, shape uh, radar target or corner reflector or maybe carrying several of them and possibly even a uh, an acoustic sensor but it is my understanding that the Air Force I'm not an Air Force spokesman it is my understanding that the Air Force and Professor Charles Moore believe that the debris on the Brazil Ranch came from the June 4th launch which was not a giant mogul type balloon well, the, the, but, the, and incidentally Randall and Schmidt agree that the photograph taken in Ramey's office does indeed show the debris from a balloon borne radar target yes now, and, the question, excuse me now you've had your minute now come on yeah. come on general the problem with this is that Debose General DeBose says categorically on tape 
that the material in the office was the cover, that the real material that had been collected was whisked away. And That's that not what he told Jamie Sandler. That eh? is on tape, and I have heard that. That you is on tape. To Jamie Sandler. Well, I've heard DuBose on tape say that no one ever saw it. Right, the well, then you contact you, uh, Don yeah. Ecker, you know Jamie Sandler, eh? because Sandler published an article in the MUFON Journal uh, a direct verbatim interview with DuBose. Do you trust du that journal? Uh, and DuBose, <laughs> I'm going on my memory here, said the material. First off, he, well, said, I Randall and Smith, he said Randall and Smith never showed me those photographs in Ramey's office. If they had, I would have said, yes, that's the material. But let's suppose. I've let's, got let's, the interview that Schmidt conducted with him, Phil, on videotape, and he says expressly, no no doubt about it, all right, well, the material you get, was changed. All right, then you get the audio tape of the interview that Jamie Sandoray had with DuBose, and of course DuBose was 92 years old at the time. But let's assume. All right, What's it have to do you with You can't it? trust anybody over 70 is what you're saying to us. Well, <laughs> what, I'm, what I'm saying to you is that if you will listen to the, the, the tape, the uh, Jamie Sandoray tape, uh, it, you will get quite a different impression. But let's assume, let's assume that that you are correct, and that the debris photographed in Ramey's office was not the debris recovered on the Brazil Ranch. Let's assume that Ramey said, oh boy, we've got to keep this secret. We've got to find some substitute debris. Where in the world would Ramey, on short notice, be able to get his hands on a radar target and balloon-like material, which had been lying in the sun for several weeks and was thus deteriorated. Well, I suppose he could call his meteorology office. He could talk, call Newton. And you recall that Newton, the meteorologist, does say he was called to come over to Ramey's office. But Newton, who is still alive today, has never said that General Ramey said, hey, find me an old balloon and an old radar reflector and beat it up into small pieces and bring that over to my office. So you tell me, where did Ramey find that debris? Well, why would, if in fact it was only this debris, why would General Exxon then have stated that this debris or... or a part of this debris recovered was sent to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, if, in fact, everybody knew it was a simple weather or mogul balloon. And let's face it, mogul, the Project Mogul uh, balloons, that stuff didn't say, stay secret forever. That, no, that it material was declassified was in 1970, as I recall it. This material, well, people were, knew about it and were talking about it in the 50s. Not as to... They, they knew they, there was a cover story that these were scientific balloons. The actual purpose of it, the intent of it, that was still classified. But where, Phil, where, would, sorry, General Ramey, where would General Ramey get the debris? Phil, I'm going to have to interrupt you. We're at the top of the hour. Uh, we'll cover that when we come back, okay? Okay. Okay, stand by. All right, my name is Don Ecker. Joining me in studio tonight is Mr. Dwight Schultz. The name of the program, UFOs Tonight. You're listening to the Cable Radio Network. Each week we bring you some of the most fascinating information in this fascinating topic of UFOs. Tonight's guest, special guest, Mr. Philip Class, author of numerous books, editor of the Skeptical UFO Newsletter. We're going to tell you more about that in a while and how you can get it. And a senior editor with Aviation Week and Space Technology. We'll be back after this. I am the Canadian of the Astro Command. And when I want to know who is visiting the third planet of the star I saw, I listen to UFOs tonight, every Saturday night, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, according to the openings on CRN, the cable radio network. This is the UFO News and Media Update for January 21st, 1995. Ufology's only activist organization, Operation Right to Know, is cranking up the volume on its call to end UFO secrecy. 
A petition sent to countries the world over would be presented to the United Nations in early July of this year. Besides the petition drive, Operation Right to Know is asking for citizens of participating nations to make specific gestures in support of the UFO cause. During the first week of July, blue ribbons displayed in neighborhoods everywhere will signify a call for the release of UFO secrets. Brenda Lancaster conceived the current efforts, which she calls a week of public awareness and action aimed at the governments of the world. In two days, Walt Disney World begins a four-week media event to introduce its new Tomorrowland, featuring the extra terror estrial alien encounter attraction. Disney honcho Michael Eisner feels it's not scary enough, we hear. There'll be other attractions, however. Starring the first two weeks is a roundup of top UFO researchers. The entire event will be moderated by your host for this show, Don Ecker. And speakers set to inform visiting journalists include Zechariah Sitchin, George Knapp, Russ Estes, Yvonne Smith, and abduction experiencers Terry Stone, Don Wells, and Vern Maltese. So, Disney meets UFOs, definitely a Tomorrowland kind of thing. The UFO News and Media Update is brought to you by the best UFO publication on the planet, UFO Magazine. I'm Vicki Cooper. Now back to Don Ecker, Dwight Schultz, and their guest, Philip Class on UFOs Tonight. back once again and Phil uh, before we start taking some calls and I'm going to tell everybody to if you've been holding off waiting to call in now's your chance start ringing those and do I get a chance to comment about General Exxon absolutely of course all right uh, uh, but, but before we we get into that let me ask you just as an aside let's speculate for one minute what if what if a genuine extraterrestrial craft were to crash? I mean, no doubt about it. It was a true ET craft, and it crashed. And the military moved in, and we're speculating now, and they picked it up. Do you believe they could keep it secret? For, well, I once asked a friend of mine, a, an Air Force colonel, now retired, who was an aide to General Happ Arnold, and who spent many years in the Pentagon, and I asked him, I said, imagine that a courier came into the chief of staff of the Air Force, closed the door and said, uh, for your ears only, we have just recovered an extraterrestrial craft super cosmic top secret and I said to my colonel friend I said how long do you think it would take before before every secretary in the Pentagon knew this fact he said about 30 minutes I said gee I figured it'd take two hours so in other words what you're saying is you don't believe they could keep it secret not this kind of a secret but if if that were to happen I would expect to see some after effects. Let me give you an example. Supposing that the Air Force recovered an extraterrestrial craft at Roswell uh, in the summer of 47, then the word would go out, We've got, we don't know whether this is a precursor to an attack by the extraterrestrials. We've got to go all out to try to develop defenses against these uh, flying saucers. Now, at the time of the Roswell incident, July of 47, the Air Force was funding two programs, one at General Electric, one at Ryan Aeronautical, to develop supersonic air-to-air -air missiles. Now, you know, UFOs are supposed to be very fast, so you, this is what you would need to try to defend against it. A year after Roswell, they had the Air Force canceled both of those supersonic air-to-air -air missile programs, which is the last thing that you would do if you had any evidence that you had extraterrestrial visitors who might possibly be hostile. 
<laughs> well, it's obvious that they couldn't keep it all secret. I mean, we do know that that something happened there. Uh, at well, least, at least looking at it from my angle, from Dwight's angle, I think we would agree that it was something that has a very high degree of strangeness. But, Phil, the idea that the gov government cannot keep a secret is ludicrous. You and I both know they can. They do it every day, and they oh, do it sometimes that's... for many years. Yeah. Just this past year, under President Clinton, Hazel O'Leary, who is the uh, director of the Department of Energy, released information about uh, civilians, uh, in, in many cases, uh, civilians, as we found out, that claimed to be terminal, were injected with radioactive material. Uh, mothers with nursing children were given radioactive material. Retarded children with fed plutonium in their milk. We know this happened. Just the other day in the New York Times, we now find out that healthy people were secretly poisoned by radioactive material. Now, if the DOE had not uh, released this information, it would still be top secret. How do you explain it? It's been 50 years. We know they can. And if it, in fact, were an extraterrestrial craft, according to scientist Wilbert Smith, who was a Canadian in 1950, he claimed that the United States government rated this two levels above top secret. Yep, that was his claim. Two levels above top secret. And I, I claim to be the smartest, handsomest ufologist in the world. Now, let's... Let's talk about the debris. Um, if this was extraordinary debris, and if it was flown to right field, as General Exxon claims, there was a the place that it should have been sent was to the um, Battelle Memorial Institute. This was in an hour's drive away in Columbus, Ohio, and as which incidentally is a civilian think tank. Uh, well, it's not just a think tank. It was, uh, they were the ones that in 52 were hired it, yes. to do the uh, Project Blue Book analysis of UFO reports. And in the May-June 1993 issue of International UFO Reporter, published by the Heineck Center for UFO Studies, uh, Jenny Zeidman, who had worked there at the time, had a most interesting article. And let me quote just a bit of it. She said, during the 1940s and 50s, Battelle was surely one of the premier metallurgy uh, research facilities in the world. Battelle was well established as a trusted and respected facility for top secret work, including the Manhattan Project. Its staff included top metallurgists, welding technology experts, physical chemists, and so on and so on. The supposition that Battelle analyzed Roswell or other UFO artifacts is a simple and obvious theory. Then Zeidman said, much to our surprise and initial puzzlement, none of the interviews and none of our other research have yet provided any evidence that Battelle has ever been in possession of UFO artifacts for Roswell or any other UFO case. And as for the elderly gentlemen whom we interviewed, their choice of words, their directness, their body language, all indicate that to their knowledge, no UFO artifacts were ever analyzed. That doesn't surprise me in the least. We're still talking about a civilian organization, if in fact... But they were cleared to do top secret. But this was rated according to at least some people, including, including Robert Sarbacher, as being above top secret. Now my question is, if, if this, in fact, was suspected of being extraterrestrial, it makes perfect and very logical sense that the military would have kept it strictly hands on this material, and if they needed a civilian uh, metallurgist, that they would have brought them in from the outside. Well, they would have brought them in from Battelle, nearby, because Battelle did their top And if they work. did, these people still would not have been allowed to talk back at Patel. So once again, secrecy rears its head. It, it makes perfect sense. Well, to me. do you think that the GAO is cleared for ultimate secret? 
What do you think is going to happen with the GAO investigation? Do you think they're going to cover up? Well, they're not looking for flying saucers, Phil. You and I both know that. The GAO is not looking for flying saucers. The, GI, the GAO is looking for a paper trail to make sure that this, uh, this whatever it was, project, incident, that the, uh, the military authority acted in a proper and correct manner. They're not looking for little green men, and neither is Stephen Schiff. Oh, he isn't, I see. Okay. Well, as a matter of fact, I attended a most interesting CIA conference at Harvard in early December, at which the CIA released, made public, 80 formerly top-secret documents known as National Intelligence Estimates, starting in 1950, as I recall, only three years after Roswell. Now, this this assessment was prepared by the CIA uh, in collaboration with the Defense Department, with the State Department, with every intelligence agency, with the State Department and so on, to present the president every year with a strategic assessment, an estimate of where there were potential threats to the well-being of this country. And naturally, I went through the 1951. They handed out about half a dozen of them to those of us who attended. Uh, all the rest are to become available, all 80 of them, in the uh, National Archives. I urge you to come to Washington and go through them. I went through the 1950, 52, 57 to see, did they talk about a possible extraterrestrial threat? Did they warn the president? Not a mention. Not a mention. So they were keeping it secret even from the president. And as I have revealed in my uh, Skeptics UFO newsletter, I have quoted from once secret, top secret documents by top intelligence people that indicate that as of 1948, more than a year after Roswell, the current view, top secret view was that if UFOs were actual craft, that they were probably Soviet spy vehicles. And in fact, uh, one of these top secret documents dated December 10th, 1948, uh, top secret an assessment by the Air Force and Navy was released in the spring of 1985, that assessment was published, featured, in the MUFON UFO Journal. And it shows that, you know, everybody, dozens, hundreds of people that had no need to know in Roswell seemingly knew that we had extraterrestrial visitors, but all of the top defense government officials who should have been the first to know Nobody remembered to tell them. Well, then we've got to talk, if we're going to talk about that, about the 1948 Air Material Command estimate of the situation. Not Air and Material Command. Well, the January 1953 Robertson panel. But before we do that, Phil, we've got to take a break. And when we come back, we'll finish that up and we're going to start taking some calls. Bye. So please hold on. We are back. And Phil, 1953, the Robertson Scientific Panel is uh, something that has always fascinated me. If, in fact, 1953, which was approximately six months after the famous July 1952 overflights of the nation's capital, uh, the Central Intelligence Agency felt threatened to the point where they had to have some type of response to demystify this subject. Now, if there was nothing there to demystify, how do you explain they put this panel together? Well, if you will take time to read my book, UFOs, The Public Deceived, or to go through the CIA documents that they released in the late 70s, if the answer to that question will be very obvious to you. Well, After, please explain it to me. I'd like it to right, be obvious. fine. After... The operators at the National Airport reported some mysterious blips on their then new but very old military radar. It was new to them. Uh, the headlines 
on the nation's newspapers were UFOs reported over Washington. And, as the CIA papers reveal, the White House called. They called the uh, uh, right field and talked to Colonel Rupel, I mean Captain Rupel, um, and uh, as Rupel later reported, uh, it was uh, Truman's military aide who made the call, but he later heard that the president was listening in on the conversation. And the Air Force said, uh, we think it's due to a temperature inversion uh, because we've had problems with spurious targets before and hot, humid weather, but we've got to investigate it. So the Truman was a bit embarrassed, and the White House then called the CIA and said the Air Force says that they think it's only due to a temperature inversion, uh, but we'd like you to do an independent investigation. And so in July and August of 52, the CIA created a special panel of their scientific specialists to investigate, look into UFOs. They went out to the Air Force for a briefing, and in fact, in the briefing, as a result of their uh, short-term investigation, they prepared a briefing for the director of the CIA. And as I quote from my in my book, from some of these once secret documents, they reported that uh, one of the theories was that these might be men from Mars, uh, extraterrestrial spaceships. And I'm paraphrasing from memory, but the CIA document says, however, regrettably, we've never captured any craft or any debris or recovered any physical evidence. So, meanwhile, there were two groups arose within the CIA. There was one group that said, hey, this would be an interesting project for us to launch, set up our own formal group in parallel with the Air Force. There was another group within the CIA that said, look, don't get involved. We've got more pressing problems. The Russians are developing long-range missiles. They're developing long-range bombers. That's the thing to focus on. And so if you will read my book, you'll find actual quotations from some of these internal memor memoranda. Well, Phil, I have read your book, and that still does not explain the people that observed something that night other than the radar operators, including some of the radar operators who went well, outside. Have you, and, no, wait a minute. Now, I sat here the quietly, FAA, Phil. Have you read you the FAA it? report of uh, April 1953? Now, some of, the, all of, their investigation of, some of the observers included airline pilots flying commercial aircraft, and some of the military pilots admitted to seeing something in the air that left at a tremendous speed and they could not catch up. As a matter of this fact, I, of I have a letter in my file from one of those interceptor pilots who wrote to me and said, Mr. Class, all we saw were lights in the sky. He said... I, he was one of the two interceptor pilots that was sent from the air base in Delaware. When you come to Washington, I'll dig out his letter and let you read what he said. But let's assume that you were correct. Let's assume that you're correct and that this pilot who actually flew the mission was wrong. As a matter of fact, General Ramey, who had been at the 8th Air Force headquarters at the time of the Roswell incident, right. was now commander of the North American Air Defense Command, yes, he as was. I recall it. And so if he knew that we had extraterrestrial visitors, if he had known it for five years, if he knew they were now flying over the nation's capital, perhaps getting ready to attack, if he knew that, you know, they'd been picked up on the radar on July 19th and 20th, as I recall it, surely and he the would then bring know. in dozens, hundreds of interceptor planes to be based at Andrews Air Force Base and other nearby bases to try to protect the nation's capital. Well, the reason and yet a week later, a week well, later, when the radar planes reappeared, there were, it 
took them an hour to get two interceptors over Washington. That's because the bases in the Washington, D.C. area were undergoing repairs at the time. Bullshit. And bullshit. Phil, you're on the radio. Phil, you're I on the radio. I don't care. It's pure bullshit. Phil, no, I'm We've not going to... on tape. That's a good one. <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I, 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 I have to, you know, I, I showed you respect, and I, I can't believe you would, you would talk like that on my show. Okay, good night. Well, there we have it. Ladies and gentlemen, there you do have it. There it is. That is civility. Um, that, is, uh, that is courtesy. And I, I would just like to say one thing, and that that, that, that great mind and that great that great countenance that, that just left the airways. Remember the first thing he said here tonight, that tall tales can be spotted when the story changes significantly. Just remember that when you're speaking about this subject, but I, I really feel sorry for all of the people who've been holding on. Well, uh, let's, let's take some calls anyway. I still can't figure out why he dropped off. Other I, than being very tired. Well, other than the fact that I think uh, he was embarrassed for losing his temper, Let's go to the phones. Uh, let's see. We've got Dave from Yucaipa and TCI. Dave? Well, this may work out better since Mr. Class left. I was going to thank Mr. Class for being willing to stay up until 1 or 2 in the morning in his area. First, a happy new year to everybody in the studio. And Mr. Class, if he's still listening. No, no. Phil, Phil is gone. I, he doesn't I, have people. And, and for you people out there that may have heard some dead air, uh, because I, I guess Darren cut it off at the... Uh, Darren cut it off at the uh, with a seven second delay. Uh, Mr. Class said a few bad words on the air, and that that pejorative, <laughs> a few a few a few nasties. He said a few nasty things. Well, I still well, can't figure it out. A little unpredictable, Mr. Class. Well, well, maybe between the three of us, we can cover the notes that I left for Mr. Class. Maybe we can just fill in basically because he was on for like an hour and twenty five minutes. So let me just, uh, and besides that, everybody knows the word on UFOs tonight is bird poop, right? <clears throat> yeah, you said it, Dave, not me. <laughs> anyway, uh, this is what I want to cover, okay? And if I can have as much time as possible, and then just Four let Four minutes. Go. Yeah, two because minutes. <laughs> because we're going to be at the half hour break. We can't give you more time than we gave you. Oh, do I shut up? You, you gave class more time than Leak you gave that expletive and go on. Come on. <laughs> okay, first. First of all, it is true that it, there was a reward out for any information on a crashed UFO back in the 40s. Brazel came, came up with a lot of money after he gave his t testimony. He did get a brand new truck, he got an electric generator, and he got a new refrigerator. Statement one is, if there were no UFOs, and it was the famous mogul bloom that Mr. Class was talking about, the government sure wouldn't pay a reward of many tens of thousands of dollars back at that time. Was it a government re uh, yeah, reward? Yes, this is... This it was is, from a newspaper. A newspaper, right, yeah. This is uh, just basic standard knowledge. No, there was also a government reward, Don. There was. Hmm. Secondly, uh, we talked about this yes yesterday, or, or I'm sorry, last week. Uh, Mr. Class doesn't say where the alien story suddenly originated from. Thirdly, I think that Mr. Class does have the right to speak his opinion, but I don't see, as far as the in-studio people, you and Renee and Vicki and, uh, and, and Mr. Schultz, uh, over the 30, 40 years that Mr. Class has been a UFO skeptic, for what reason would you have him on the air to change his mind? We know he's not going to change his mind. Well, because so, I well, believe I believe in, in presenting all sides of the argument, Dave. You know, I, I think everybody that's been listening to this show for any length of time knows that uh, that even though I'm skeptical, I very much acknowledge the reality of the phenomenon. But I, I, I am not one of these people that just go, you know, in one direction. I believe in just like UFO magazine in presenting all sides to the question. But it's also it's also important, Dave, to to uh, allow debunkers. Now, you know, this is an interesting. Debunker is a pejorative now, but it's really not a pejorative. Debunking means to to expose falsity. That's what it really means. But, but debunkers now today are not. They are part of the false. But you know, uh, Mr. See? Schultz, Dwight. Yeah. These debunkers all line up with four names. Block, Sagan, Class, Olberg, the late Dr. Menzel, and the no, New York Times. No, you're absolutely right. I, I agree with you. But, the, but tonight, I think we demonstrated, particularly early in the show, 
that the logic that is used to deal with this, and I, and, I, and they do claim it is logic. Are, are you by chance talking about uh, that uh, Jesse Marcel wanted the million dollar reward? Well, it isn't just that Jesse Marcel wanted, but it's it's the whole concept of, of platitudes and slogans that are supposed to make you think you're too stupid to talk, but in fact, you think it'd be hoisted. Ooh, 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 ooh. Wait, wait, back up. You hit the nail right in the head about being too stupid to talk. That's exactly what I was saying when I mentioned flock. Sagan, Class, Olberg, Menzel, and the New York Times. Those are very, w wait a minute, those are very, very powerful names. Yes, they are. Those people that are peons like you, I, and Don, and the many people that are just civilians that got interested in the phenomena were the people that really broke the UFO story. Why are the Flocks, the Sagans, the Classes, the Olbergs, and the New York Times always the ones that people quote? Why are the people quoting Dwight Schultz and Don Ecker? I don't want them quoting me. <laughs> and, and, and after what after what Phil Class said on the air, which they unfortunately was bleeped, I I don't want him quoting him. Yeah. Dave, it's it's worth a half hour. We got to move along. We got a lot of phone calls. I need to cover one thing though, just real quick. Dave, though. we're at the at the half hour. Uh, okay, spit just it out me, real quick. Okay, in the current issue of UFO magazine, Paul Davids has an ad for a special that he did about the Roswell movie, and in those videotapes are the recordings that Phil Class said don't exist. The, uh, what was the man's name, Kravitz, the, uh, the duo? Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah, Thanks. okay, Dave. Bye-bye. Thanks, Dave. Okay, we got another line open, so you've been trying to call in. Now's your time. We'll be back after this. His take on the UFO thing, he's, I, I've got to say it, he's intellectually dishonest with this information. I, I did a debate with, uh, with class in Denver back in 1989, and he was denigrating the entire UFO subject, and I pointed out a case to him, which was the Frederick Valentech case, where an aircraft and a, and a young pilot disappeared flying between uh, Australia. Australia and and, uh, and New Zealand uh, after radioing in an emergency and the fact that he was having a UFO encounter. Class's way of explaining that situation was to suggest that Valentech was perhaps a drug smuggler well, for the reason that he disappeared. And, and tonight, I you remember what his proof was? Well, he had no proof, except well, that, that Valentech had four life extra, preservers. Extra life preservers. On the aircraft. <laughs> but, but, you know, tonight, seeing the same thing, and I'm beginning to suspect more and more debunkers, not, not true intellectually honest skeptics, but debunkers will go to, to any uh, extreme because they are so, the only thing I can, I can surmise, they're so threatened by this subject. Well, you know, up until this point, I've always treated Phil with respect, and I've always respected him, even though I've disagreed with him. But after tonight, I've got to say, that, 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 that has certainly hit me the wrong way. I, I'm very upset about that. Well, it, it was quite, if you can look, if anybody's, been, oh, if anybody's been listening, if there's anybody out there listening, if you think back to the evening, what these people say, and that's why I think Don is absolutely right that there is an intellectual dishonesty. You say these people didn't know, would not have known what they were seeing. They had never seen this before. What was it? Scotch tape, rubber, uh, seamstress tape with writing on it, balsa wood. You see, there is, there is a, these are polemicists, people who score points in forensic debate, but there is not a search for the truth. And when they are confronted with what, a, what we, we poor peons out here call common sense, there is turmoil inside the little brain there. There's turmoil because they're not used to dealing with common sense. Debunkers who are intellectually dishonest are used to taking statistics and very, very convoluted scenarios and twisting it and turning it away from the central issue until you get lost. Well, the only thing I can do is, is, is apologize for, uh, for his appalling bad manners. You know, I was thinking here just a second ago, if the situation were reversed and I would have been a guest on his program, the last thing in the world I would have done was, was this horrible display that I witnessed tonight. And it, I'm, a, I'm, I'm still very upset. Let's, let's go to the phones. We've got uh, John in Yukaipo who's joining us on Southland Cable. John? Hello. This Hello. Is John. Yes, John. Look, you're on. Did you have something to say? Yeah, I, I, it looks like uh, Mr. Class finally showed his true colors there at the end, didn't it? No class in class. Yeah, right? by showing no class. <laughs> He's been doing a, a very poor job at trying to explain away UFO incidences. 
I think the U.S. government should fire him. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, he still attends those CIA briefings, doesn't he? Yeah, that's a wonder. He's tired. Yeah, he's working with his condo, attending the CIA briefings, and uh, he's yeah. Well, and of course, you know, he was denigrating old uh, old DeBose because he was 92, and as I say, I guess he's just getting up there. And uh, you, know. you know, thinking back when when Travis Walton and Mike uh, Rogers were on Larry King when Firing the Sky was released a couple of years ago, Class went on Larry King with them and then turned around and swore at Mike Rogers, calling him a, a so-and-so liar. Right? Yeah, I heard that. I remember that. Well, he, he denigrated, let's see, tonight he, he started off by making fun of you and your pronunciation. He denigrated... Well, he uh, didn't like Marcel. the way I said veteran, right. but I wore the uniform that's that he right. didn't. You, yeah, that's right. And he denigrated Marcel. Uh, he basically spends his time, when he gets caught down one of those blind alleys, by low blows. And that's precisely what it's about here. You know, you just show your colors eventually when there is somebody confronting you with, a, even though this Look, this subject is arcane. This subject is mysterious. It's bizarre. It's out there. But there, but there is logic. There is a problem here. The government has thousands of documents on this subject, and that's not that's not because it's not important. It's because it is important. And when you are actually confronted, and I think he was for the first time tonight, that uh, as it appeared in the New York Times that this is a story and a myth created by kooks and cultists. No, this is a story that was created by the RAAF, the what, government what's really of the United ridiculous, States. What? Yeah, what's really ridiculous is when they try to explain away all these UFO encounters by the public as mass hysteria, or it was Venus, or it was a, a fireball, or a huge... Firefly. Well, the problem is some of them are, but all of them are not. And the problem is they will find any explanation and use it over and over again to prove that everyone well, is Stan remembering. Friedman said it very well on October the 1st on the Larry King special out of Area 51. He said it's not a question of are UFOs extraterrestrial, but are any extraterrestrial. John, we've got to run along. I want to thank you for your call. Good night. And keep those eyes pointing to the sky. We're going to go to Florida. We're going to go to Carl, who's joining us from Sorrento, Florida, on satellite. Carl, good evening. Hi, Don. How's it going? As people listening on the phone heard what he said. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll never tell. Uh, no, please tell. We want this word to spread. <laughs> we really I've, do. I've already told all my buddies on yeah. the radio. Oh, you we'll did? We've got about five or six listening to <laughs> satellite, you know. Carl, would you say I was polite and, and somewhat... Yeah, uh, well... I, I was going to trap him. I was going to tell him how wonderful he was, and it was a good thing he was getting out the truth. <laughs> and then I was going to lay this one on him. Maybe you've heard about this. About five weeks ago, somebody called from northern Michigan into um, uh, for the people, Chuck Harder. Yeah. And he said that they had still photographs, 35 millimeter, blow up, almost as good as Billy Myers. And then I heard from another source that they've got at least 30 minutes of video. And then two weeks ago, Paul Harvey commented on it. I didn't hear Paul Harvey. So I was going to ask him. There was a woman in Michigan who, who had uh, um, videoed this, yes. Yeah, well, this was a man. Uh, I could look it up. Well, there's uh, a woman also. Okay, but the man called. And he said they were going nationwide with these pictures and everything. So I was going to ask him, you know, uh, Mr. Class sometimes writes the debunk before the, before the story gets out. So I was going to ask him uh, what fraud this was. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he's heard about it. Have you heard anything? No, I haven't. I haven't, Carl. I haven't in the least. Well, it's in the grapevine, so... Uh, well, we'll Maybe keep, we'll get to see him. We'll keep our ears peeled, my friend. Look, we've got we've got all the all lines right. lit up. I've got to move along, but thank you, Carl, right, and, and keep listening. Okay, we're going to go to, we've got our old friend Ralph, I think, back. Ralph from Escondido. Ralph, how are you doing? Well, hi, how are you doing? Just Good. fine. I, you, you were on the, uh, on the phone when, uh, when yes. class blew up, weren't you? Yes, I was. Okay. Well, what was your your take on on Phil's uh, intellectual honesty? Well, <laughs> you're putting me on the. You know, I've read. Damn right, I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've read his articles for years. They're very thoughtful and accurate in in uh, scientific terms. Yes. In in Aviation Week, I would not expect him to blow up like that. I mean, I, that's totally out of character, at least as I understand him. 
Well, I don't think it's out of character because I, I must tell you that this is, has been his behavior uh, throughout all of the debates that I have seen. Uh, in, um, ad hominem attacks uh, to, to make fun of somebody in the middle of uh, uh, an argument and to say pretty awful things about people. The comment about Marcel, uh, what he said about Valentech in the debate with John, which was not on the show tonight, but it, it is a tip it's typical behavior. And I don't understand how he has gotten to this point without it being pointed out to him. Because it, it's, it is dishonest. It is an example of, uh, well, you, you know, when your intellectual capacity start breaking down, and it isn't because of his age. It's because the, it's not the truth that you're dealing with. You can't follow the truth, so what you do is you call somebody a name. Well, you know, I was going to ask him about the 1974 helicopter incident in Ohio, uh, because he did a detailed analysis of that, and I, I think that he, re that he said that the crew uh, confused up collective with down collective, which makes the helicopter go up and down. And I wanted right. to ask him about that. Unfortunately, he's not there. Well, you, you heard what, what Phil said, and if, if I, I would have had to have cut him off, even if Darren uh, wouldn't, have, wouldn't have stopped the air. But, uh, but he hung up. I mean, I was willing to keep going, but, but class wasn't. So, uh, like a pundit said one time, class dismissed. Uh, <laughs> I, I would like to, you know, I found something interesting out. A few weeks ago, I saw Dr. Stanton Friedman on Larry King's Yes, you lived below him, didn't you? You lived. You you lived in well, no, 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 his books. No, you were following Stanton. Be precise now. Stanton is not a doctor. He is not a PhD. That's right. Go ahead. Uh, I knew him as Dr. Stan Friedman, a new PhD from Chicago University of Chicago. Hmm. And he went to work for the Aircraft Nuclear Propulsion Division. GE, right. And I was a young boy. I borrowed physics books from him, and I also borrowed uh, Donald Kehoe's book from him, and that's how my interest got started. Hmm. And when I saw him, I thought, my God, I know him. That's the Dr. Stan Friedman who uh, loaned me doc, uh, Kehoe's and Edwards' books that got me started, uh, at least interested in, in UFOs. Well, did you see him on Larry King back in October at the Area 51 special? Yes, and that's where I first recognized him as the Dr. Stan Friedman that I knew. Do you remember what Larry said to him? He, he called him Dr. Friedman, and, and Stanton looked at him and said, Larry, please, no one earned degrees. <laughs> Well, I'm totally confused because I thought he was a Ph.D. from the University of Chicago. No. No, well, so he's got an M.A., but well, he's not a Ph.D. Frequently, no. people can act like a Ph.D. to the point where you think they are. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what that means, don't you? Piled, hiring me. Oh, stop. <laughs> okay. Stan Friedman is, he's pretty good. Oh, he's a good yeah, guy. He's pretty good. All right, Ralph, we've got to move along. We've got to take a real quick break here, and the phone lines are still lit up, and we've got to get back to those phones. But I want to thank you for your call. Okay. And, you know, it's possible that tonight... <laughs> Phil was an A9 variant. <laughs> we'll be back after that. That was for you, Ralph. And we are back. No, Phil's not back. Well, he's not <laughs> back, but you and I are back. <laughs> Let's see. Phil, Let's Phil, Phil, <laughs> Phil. Let's see if the satellite will catch up. Johnny Chung, Johnny Chung, Johnny Chung. Johnny Chung. Let's go to Charles in West Covina, who's joining us on TCI. Charles, good evening. Hi, good evening. Um, my question is kind of mediocre. I'm kind of a novice. <laughs> well, then I'll cut you off. Uh, <laughs> mediocre? Cut <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, no, off Phil's response here. I, I, oh, <laughs> right. well, I think, I don't, I don't really know. I, I, was, I was listening to your show, and uh, um, I think that that... Uh, what was wrong with that guy? Who was he? I mean, was he really important? Or yes, he is. He's a very bright guy. No, he's a very, very bright, intelligent man who has uh, represented the government's position for 30 years. Oh. <laughs> yes. He says, as in, he says just as a hobby. But as I, you know, as I was saying down earlier, it's just inc extra incredible. A man spends 30 years chasing a herd of jackasses trying to prove that he's superior. Whoa. Mm. <laughs> um. Well, that's certainly one way to look at it, but why don't you tell us what you're really thinking, Dwight? <laughs> oh, well, well, anyway, go ahead. Um, my question is, is kind of like a really mediocre question, but I, um, it's about crop circles. Okay. Uh, are most of them hoaxes, or do you think that uh, they're actually created by... Uh, well, some of them are hoaxes, and then some of them appear not to be. Um, and Charles, I'll that's about as much as I can tell you. Oh, I mean, how can you really tell the hoaxes from the really uh, genuine thing? 
Well, the hoax, uh, the hoax circle. They tell the hoaxers tell us that yeah. these are hoax. Oh, <laughs> that's, that's, that's been it. one way. That's it. These uh, are hoax. And and, and there's, I also have a question about plasma. What really is plasma in the theory about plasma? You talking about blood plasma or no, air no, plasma? The, the air, pl- the, yeah, the air mm-hmm. plasma, like glowing balls of gas, of hot, heated, flame. very yeah. superheated yeah. gas, heated, superheated oh. gas. Oh. So. Oh, oh. I don't have any right now, so. <laughs> we gotta go. Okay, we're gonna go to Mike and Paso Robles. Robles, is that it? Paso Robles. Mike, are you there? Yeah, Mike's here. Oh, okay. Is I'm that is that me. Paso Ro- Robles? Paso Robles. Okay. Yeah, it's in the Central Coast. Hey, probably uh, East Coast. San Luis Obispo will probably target you. Most people know where that. I'm is. from the East Coast. You just, had you, you just had an earthquake a few weeks ago, right? Uh, not in our particular area. No, that'd be uh, further south by about three hours. Uh, okay. What What was uh, on your mind, Mike? Oh, um, well, I'm a novice also, like the uh, last caller, mm-hmm. and uh, I'd just like to tell you something I saw. Um, it just added to your data bank of information. Okay. Uh, is it going to be very long? No, no. This is brief and short. I can make it really fast here. Okay. Because it's been a weird night for you guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it has. Yeah. <laughs> Now, um, I was somewhere uh, in uh, the Mojave Desert. Uh, this was a vacation with the family. And we looked out the window, and we saw in the sky for about eight minutes or so a grouping of small lights, uh, No, nothing distinguishing about them, like little colors or anything like that. But they were swirling around one another. Almost as, uh, sometimes you see birds do that in spring, mm-hmm. large flocks of birds mm-hmm. that tumble. And uh, it was just quite striking. Uh, they were left behind us as we were traveling in the car. In other words, they didn't stay parallel as we looked out. But they were swirling and moving and tumbling, and they were doing uh, uh, geometric figures hmm. in the air. And quite a long sighting. There was no noise. Uh, they didn't suddenly just, like, uh, disappear. There wasn't any tracers or anything like that. Uh, almost as if uh, tiny little flashlight beams were on your ceiling, like in your bedroom, very controlled, almost like laser beam light points, uh, or swarms of bees, it would suggest. Hmm. Yeah, um, just thought I would add that to you. Uh, I've never really talked to anybody. When was this, Mike? Uh, this would probably be about in about 1964, 1965. Almost 30 years ago. Uh, quite a long time ago, yeah. Did you see this with anybody else? Uh, yeah, my, uh, my mother and my father uh, were in the front seats. And I was in the back, and uh, we were just... How old were you then, Mike? Oh, gosh, I'd been about, about 12. Okay. Uh-huh. Are your folks still living? Uh, yeah, my father's still alive. My mom has passed away. But it was one of those interesting conversations where you rationally try to explain something and everything that you come up with. Uh, just is not going to explain it away. <laughs> you know, like I can remember my father at the time trying to explain to me that it was afterburners, that these were jets with afterburners. But we were kind of high. Which probably would have would have made some kind of weird sense then, wouldn't it? Um, well, it was just kind of like the the rational mind trying to explain away something that exactly. it had, it had never seen before. So exactly. it's, it's a natural process. How long have you been listening to the show, Mike? Uh, this is the second time. Uh, maybe about a month ago, I just happened to catch it, and uh, it's something that's very interesting to me. Well, by golly, we'll expect you here each week from now on. Okay. Um, one more thing real quick. Also, as uh, I had uh, for a long time, I used to ask people if they'd ever seen anything because it was a good icebreaker conversationally. Mm-hmm. And a good German friend of mine, a student, uh, uh, got, sp- got spanked by his father for telling uh, that he had seen a, a small, uh, seamless silver sphere uh, hovering above a fence about the size of a basketball, uh, motionless, uh, no sound. And he said he saw it for about 10, 15 seconds, and it just went straight up. Well, that's and very interesting because in Lo- that's just been videoed in London and uh, in England, and uh, was on sightings uh, with a helicopter mm-hmm. hovering above it. Huh. Well, and, uh, and so he, it's a it's a it's a common report. Really? Yes. Yeah, it's almost as if, uh, well, you know, uh, Sputnik. Yes. Some round sphere. And uh, it was a kind of one of those things where you talk with the individual, uh, he was very genuine with me. 
And he wasn't the kind of person that uh, talked about these sort of things. Okay, Mike. We've yeah, got thank a, you very much. We've got uh, for line, but thank you for your keep call, and please and, keep listening. And your host, uh, uh, you're the host, you're Don, right? Uh, right. Yes, I'm and Dwight, then your co host is Dwight. Dwight. Schultz, you're right. Okay, both of you, I think you're doing a really fine job. You sound like real uh, bright minds in a cloudy world. Well, <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, we appreciate it. Thank Mike. you very thank much. You. Have fun. Bye bye. bye. Okay, we've got one line, two lines open if you've been trying to call in and do it. We're going to go to New York now. We've got John calling us and joining us on satellite. John, good evening. Hi, guys. Hey, Dwight, I got to see a picture in a book the other day. Which, which book was that? One of those Star Trek books. My uh. da daughter got one. First thing I did was look you up. <laughs> 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 hey, listen, what I wanted to comment on was uh, one thing when he made a comment that Mar 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 Marcel, Marcel was a ham. Yes. Now, he, really. he would have known what a corner reflector was. Of course he would have. And especially the, since this was nothing new, I mean, reflecting off tinfoil during the war, uh, they were doing that in England. Sure they were. Well, the British, so, that, that's how the British were able to win the Battle of Britain right. with radar. Myself. Right, so this was, this was nothing so exotic that no. somebody wouldn't know what it was. Let's get on the record. Marcel said he was familiar with all of those things. He said it. He said he was familiar with the balloons. He was familiar with all of that stuff, and of course he was. And then the other thing is, where where they say the balloon? Where, he, where does he say the balloon came from? I heard someone else say that the wind. They had checked on the wind at that time, and it was not blowing that way at all. Well, that's that's Randall. Uh, yeah. Randall has said that they checked the me meteorological data, uh -huh. and that the other uh, launches, the other the previous launches, went in the opposite direction, and the the winds aloft were the same and hadn't changed, and that the Carl Flock proposed mogul balloon would have followed uh, the pathway. Well, I was going to mention that yeah. to, to, to Phil this evening Can't before know. he blew up and yeah. hung up. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that, it's kind of like something a four-year-old would do, wouldn't you say? Uh, I, I would it say it was that. amazing. It was amazing. And I mean, if you notice tonight, see, it was not a good night for Phil. Phil had, a, Phil had a really hard time with his own logic. It kept being thrown back in his face, and he couldn't face it. Uh, he was trying to hang up from the start. Yes, he was. He got, he got very upset early he, he was, on. Yeah, right, right. One other suggestion I have. Um, you may want to think about, or did you ever think about, interviewing or having on the show some of the astronomers from local areas. Yes. Like I'm in the Binghamton area of uh, New York. Well, we have some we have some astronomers out here too, John. Yeah, and and I know I had spoken to this one fellow, and he was the uh, whatever they call him, the head of the you know observatory. And uh, I said, did you ever see anything? He says, no. He says, but I believe it. He says because I have spoken to too many doctors, policemen, you know, reputable people. Right. That have seen things, and uh, he says I they've got to be real. Uh, but he says, I've never seen anything, but there must be quite a few of them that have, if they scan the skies all night long, you know? Amen. Maybe there's something out there. Okay. Okay, John. Hey, thank, thank you, you for calling. Yeah. Bye-bye. Uh, bye. Have a good evening. All right. We were going to go to Debbie, who had called in from Little Rock, but it looks like Debbie hung up. So now I'm going to go to Vince, who's calling from La Puente on United. Vince, good evening. Uh, hello. Good evening. Um, yeah. I, I tell you that I really love the show. Well, thank you. Thank you. I've been a big fan for so long. Well, that's great, Vince. What's on your mind? Yeah, I have a couple of um, hot dogs on the grill, and I was wondering if they were, like, pretty delicious. Yep, that's great. Let's go to Kevin, who's <laughs> calling from Simi <Sina> Valley. <laughs> Kevin, good evening. Yeah, hi, how are you doing? I'm fine. I've seen your show a couple times, and um, a caller a while ago was talking about uh, spheres that you were seen on siding. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I saw them on another program down in Florida that they were just like hovering in the air and all of a sudden like instantly just jetted off out of sight, and it was a really good video of it. And I was just wondering, what, what's your explanation? Well, you know, the, the problem is, uh, the, well, the one that was on sightings was consistent in this, uh, there was some reference point because there was a helicopter yeah, was and the, the, the sphere was hovering above a crop circle and then the helicopter uh, literally started uh, buzzing uh, the people taking the video. Yeah, exactly. Right, and um, there is no, I mean, what is the explanation for it? I, I mean, you, you just say, that is what a lot of people have described and I've never seen it, but there it is on video and 
uh, if it's real, it's uh, it's important. But you know, the, that's that's what we're that's what you're left with. Yeah, uh, did you, I, don't know, I, I may have found a hard copy or something from a bogus show like that. But uh, in Gulfport, Florida, Gulf Breeze, Gulf Breeze, that's right. it. And they were just like, there's like a, a guy having a video, and you can see like a ball there or a spear. And all of a sudden, it would sit up a little bit, and it would just jet off, and you can actually see it jet off, mm. like, to the left of the screen. Have you seen that, or...? Uh, I haven't seen the one you're talking about, or I'm not. I mean, I've seen... Sometimes you see these lights in the sky, and you see little blips on... Te- and I, I can't make anything out of, other than I'm looking at a blip, you know, but... Um, um, I mean, I'm, I'm not familiar with the particular one you're talking about. A lot of time. Thanks very much. Okay, thank Enjoy you. Enjoy this edition of Don Echo. Okay. Thank you, Kevin. Okay, well, that's it, I guess. Classic show tonight. Another week. Uh, tomorrow, I'm going to be leaving with uh, Vicky to go down to Disney World, or Disney World to uh, moderate this event. Uh, hopefully, they're going to be much, much more professional than, than uh, my guest this evening. And incidentally, ladies and gentlemen, let me one more time apologize for that. I know probably most of you did not uh, did not hear what transpired because it was bleeped, but uh, I've got to tell you, I'm still shocked. This coming week, we are going to be doing a show with Paul Davids, executive producer of Roswell the Movie, and very, very likely Jeremy Kagan, who directed it. And Phil, if you're still alive, we invite you to call in. <laughs> That's it. Here's the music. We'll see you in a week. And me. Keep those eyes pointed to the skies. And good evening. Here it is, already three weeks into 1995, January the 21st, 1995. My name is Don Ecker, the show, UFOs Tonight. And each week, coast to coast, we bring you news on one of humankind's most misunderstood subjects, and that, of course, is the subject of UFOs. And joining me tonight in studio once again, Mr. Dwight Schultz, to help me carry this program through. Dwight, good to see you. Good to see you, Don. I've been looking for CRN. Uh, I can't find it. I know it announces it itself. It presents it presents this show every week, uh, but I have yet to see CRN. So I, I'm not the quite sign, sure. The sign is right over there in the window. Well, but I mean, this show is supposed to deal with truth, and I, I don't know the CRN presents this show. But I do. Can I say something, Don? I want to say happy birthday to Frank Lupo tonight. Uh, it's his 40th birthday. He was a writer, producer, and co-creator of the A-Team and a very good friend of mine for a very long time. And there's another new listener in the Bay Area. 40. 40. Big can, can, you, can you trust anybody over uh, 30? I can trust anybody right about now as old as I am. Oh. So, uh, and we have another new listener tonight in the Bay Area, a very, very dear friend of mine, John Comerford, uh, a man who was my agent in New York City and... Um, uh, I is responsible for me making uh, some uh, some very very good decisions uh, at, at a time when I I didn't 
trust what I was hearing, and he told me and steered me in the, in the right way. And I'm 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 well off, I guess, today because of John, and uh, he's a bright. This man is all touching, but what the hell does that have to do with UFOs? Well, I you, you, you told me I could say oh, anything oh. I wanted to say. It didn't matter. I mean, isn't that what we do every week? Go ahead, make <laughs> me look bad. All right. <laughs> and we have a great show tonight. And I want you to go ahead and tell everybody. This is a very special show for me because this is someone that I have uh, watched and read his books, and I've listened to him, and watched him debate, and uh, he is. Uh, he claims to be a voice of sanity and reason, and I think he. I think he is to a large degree, uh, but not all the time. And I've really been looking forward to this show tonight. Well, you know, this show presents all questions of the UFO question of the UFO enigma. Uh, we present all sides, just like UFO magazine does. We take a look at the pro as well as the con side. And tonight's guest is a special guest. It's a gentleman that was on this program uh, before roughly a little over a year and a half ago, give or take a couple of months. Yes. And it's somebody that I've been trying to get back. And last summer, uh, for a number of months, I tried to get this gentleman on the, uh, on the program because at that time, the question about the Roswell incident was heating up. Uh, What's there that, was Roswell? information. Well, this is, this is a place where uh, there used to be an atomic bomb wing hmm. about almost 50 years ago down there, a bomb wing called the 509th. And in July of 1947, if we are to believe people like uh, William Moore, uh, Stanton Friedman, Kevin Randall, Don Schmidt, Some uh, of those strange, a very strange incident happened. Hmm. People claim that uh, a so-called flying saucer crash there and subsequently the government covered it up well tonight's guest has been described as the Sherlock Holmes of ufology uh, I think Walt Andrus the international director of MUFON referred to him as the younger brother of Sherlock Holmes but we're not sure about that but tonight's guest is none other than Mr. Phil Class Phil has been a voice, although on the on the pro side of the UFO question, not always a welcome voice, but has been a voice in the field of UFO research for over 30 years. And I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome Phil once again to UFOs tonight. Phil, thank you for joining us back in Washington. Well, Don, thank you very much. I expect that those will be the kindest words <laughs> that I will hear during the next two hours. Well, this is Dwight Schultz, uh, Mr. Class, and it's a great pleasure and an honor Hi, to Dwight. share a radio program with you. Phil, let's uh, let's get right down to brass tacks. This week, uh, I received your latest issue of the Skeptic. Dwelled into, I found class would often go on letter writing campaigns in an effort to discredit someone that he disagreed with. Now, in retrospect, what happened on this show really offended me in a very profound way. Like I said, this happened in 1995. Now, in 1990, at the MUFON UFO symposium that took place in Pensacola, Florida, I literally saved Phil Class's butt. It was at the Friday night get-together, of course, this was usually a meeting in a bar where the MUFON symposium was being held. Everybody could gather, have drinks, chit-chat, talk, see old acquaintances, and what have you. And it was at that Friday night get-together, I was sitting with class at a table down in Pensacola when a huge guy, about 250 pounds, came up to the table, obviously drunk, recognized Phil Class, and literally started picking on Class and got right in his face. Now, this offended me for a lot of reasons, not the least of which Phil was, at that time, getting up there in years. He was physically a small man, and it was apparent to me that he was quite... Well, I don't know if terrified is the right word, but he was very upset. I jumped up from the table, pushed that guy back, and I shamed him into leaving. And I was prepared to go further if I had to. I've never been one to let a little guy get picked on by a big guy and do nothing about it. 
Well, that made no difference. Class was one of those people that had, like I said, that sneaky side to them. Probably during the course of this show, I should have reminded them of that incident. But at any rate, you're going to have to make up your own mind when you hear it. Now, this particular radio program becomes very obvious to the listener that class was contentious almost from the beginning. As you'll hear within the first half hour of the broadcast, Phil Class was ready to hang up the telephone, especially when I would start to point out some faulty holes in Phil's logic. And this was literally the last time I ever spoke to Phil Class prior to his death. So without a lot of further ado, let's get on with the show. I think you're going to find this vastly interesting. And uh, you're going to have to make up your own mind about what happened here. But on with the program. This is UFOs Tonight that took place January the 21st, 1995. Hope you enjoy And welcome back to another edition of Dark Matters Radio. I'm your host. My name is Don Ecker. If I had to pick one radio show in all the years that I have either hosted radio or I've appeared as a guest, the show you are about to hear would figure absolutely as the most prominent one ever in my mind. 
As a matter of fact, this show in some quarters is legendary. It took place in January of 1995, January the 21st, and my guest that evening was noted UFO skeptic Philip Klass. Now, back in those days, Klass was considered absolutely the premier UFO skeptic, or as even Klass himself used to joke, I was always the skunk that entered the UFO garden party. Now, I had known Klass almost since my initial entry into the field of UFO research. First met him on the telephone back in the late 1980s while I was director of research for UFO magazine. And I got to say that if we were not talking UFOs, I found class to be quite likable. And at that time, I often found it rather strange or unusual the way some in the UFO field absolutely loathed class. Later, I was to find out that class had an extremely sneaky side to him. As a matter of fact, going back into some of the UFO history, that I fix UFO newsletter. And I would like to take this opportunity uh, to uh, advise everybody that has an interest in this field that I think it's very important that publications like this uh, should be read. And before we get the, the program over tonight, Phil, I want you to tell everybody how they can, how they can subscribe to the Skeptics UFO newsletter. But once again, you have taken uh, a very uh, investigative tack toward the question of some of what you called key eyewitness testimony. Um, the, the very first person mentioned in the new issue of the Skeptics UFO Newsletter is Jim Ragsdale, who is a witness that Kevin Randall and Don Schmidt used in their, uh, their latest book, The Truth About the UFO Crash at Roswell. And even, uh, even Mr. Randall now is stating that Mr. Ragsdale has changed his story from what it originally was. Significantly. What, what, can, you, what can you tell us about, about this? And, and for those people out there, uh, Phil, that, that may not be aware of this, this individual in the field, can you lay a little background for that? Well, I've never met him. I, when I was down to Roswell last March for the press conference um, in behalf of Randall and Schmidt's new book, um, I tried to meet with him. I talked to him on the phone, invited him to dinner. Uh, he claimed that he had, or said he had an illness that would prevent it. So I've never met the gentleman. Um, and no, I think to be fair, Phil, we have to say that, that Mr. Ragsdale is in fact very ill. Well, <laughs> he told me he had, uh, as I recall it, uh, uh, cancer of the throat or something of that sort, a uh, uh, rather serious. But in any event. Um, as you and I know, uh, one of the ways in which one spots a tall tale is if the person significantly changes their story. What do I mean by significant? Well, if you, for example, were to say that uh, you had a UFO sighting shortly after lunch about 1 o'clock in the afternoon, and then sometime later in describing it, you said that it happened about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, I do not consider that a significant discrepancy. Now, you know, particularly if it happened a few years ago. But if, for example, you said you were alone, walking alone at night when you saw the UFO, and then later, in a later account, you said you were walking with your brother and sister and wife, that there were four of you present. That would be what I would consider a significant discrepancy. <clears throat> well, the, the uh, fact that Ragsdale, in fact, did change his story, and there is some speculation about this, uh, that it may have been for a monetary purpose. That was what Kevin Randall 
said right. in his talk. Uh, and if Ragsdale had been the only witness to this event, that certainly would cast doubt on it. But let, let's go back to the very beginning, and, and we, can, we can hit on Ragsdale again. Yeah. Uh, in, in July of 1947, the only nuclear-powered, uh, nuclear-armed military unit in the planet was the 509th bomb wing, the same folks that dropped the atomic bomb on the Japanese, which ended World War II. They were based at uh, Walker Field outside of Roswell, New Mexico. It was called Roswell Army Airfield at the time, but later renamed Walker Air, uh, Airfield. And the uh, group itself was considered one of the most elite and secret secret groups then in existence because of the fact that they were the only people that had nuclear weapons. Uh, along sometime between July 2nd to July 4th, an event happened that today still is, uh, is much argued over, which is one of the reasons this program is on the air tonight. Uh, originally, the regular Army Air Force, it was before the, uh, it, it became the United States Air Force, it was still then a part of the Army. Right, it was a couple of months. Actually, the transition, I think, occurred in mid or late September uh, when it changed from being the Army Air Force to the U.S. Air Force, an independent service. Right, an independent service. But it was uh, the regular Army Air Force that initially made the press release that the RAAF, in fact, had gotten their hands on a flying disc, not debris, not, uh, you know, not, not parts of a weather balloon or anything else. They specifically stated a disc. Did you want to say something, well, Roy? Yeah, the Air Force, in fact, said they had, re or the RAAF, had recovered a flying saucer. Now, and I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Class, yeah, if you would apply, right, uh, may I just say, well, yeah, I think they called it a flying disc. The, uh, I'm the, not sure. The headline it. said saucer disc was used in the story. Okay. And I wanted to ask you, would you apply your rationale that a tall tale can be spotted when a story changes significantly? Uh, to that story that the Air Force released that they had recovered a flying saucer and then the next day said it was a weather balloon. Could you apply your rationale to that story? That is a, a good question that you asked, right? Um, <clears throat> let's suppose that you're out walking tomorrow and you find some mysterious debris, for example, and you report uh, to your local newspaper that you have found some uh, mysterious debris. And supposing the next day that um, um, the Army announces, after examining it, that this is the debris from a test missile that went astray. Um, <clears throat> now, the fact is that we talk about the uh, Roswell Army Air Force or the Army Airfield announcing. Now, you and I both know that an airfield does not announce anything, that human beings announce things. And in fact, if one goes back... Well, to just, a, just for one second, it did say R-A-A-F announces. Recovered a flying saucer. Right. right. And fortunately, now... Uh, young Lieutenant Hout, Walter Hout, then a young lieutenant, had no training, no formal training or background as a press officer. He'd been trained as a navigator and a bombardier. And as he explained to me, you know, he uh, was sort of drafted and told that you are now public information office. And when he wrote the release, he did not attribute it to anyone. He said the uh, Roswell Army Airfield announces or has come into possession. I don't have it right in front of me here. And the reporter at the Roswell Daily Record, being a good reporter, uh, said to him, uh, you know, to whom shall we attribute this? Um, shall I attribute it to you, young Lieutenant Walter Hout? And Hout told him, no, attribute it to Major Jesse Marcel, 
the intelligence officer. But Phil, wait a minute. We both know that Hout would not have taken that responsibility to write a press release about that unless he had been directed, which he also stated he was directed by Colonel Blanchard, who was the base commander. This is what he now states. But if you go back to the original um, release as reported in the Roswell Daily Record, and, and I can dig it out 